the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. Hello and welcome to Squawk Box. Here are your headlines today. The Nasdaq closes at a fresh record high with Nvidia leading gains as markets predict an outsized impact from the chip giant's earnings. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon signals his time in the top job will end in less than five years, while ruling out any additional buybacks with a stock at elevated levels. I think we're in a very good position to continue investing in our future and, and we're not going to buy back stock now. U.S. President Joe Biden hitting out at the International Criminal Court after prosecutors threaten arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and three Hamas leaders over alleged war crimes. Whatever these warrants may imply, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas, contrary to allegations against Israel made by the International Court of Justice. What's happening is not genocide. We reject that. And UK pharma giant AstraZeneca gets set to lay the medium ground plans for the company at its investor day here in Cambridge. We'll be discussing the outlook with the CFO, that's Aranhan Serin. That's coming up at 8.40 CET. Fresh record on the Nasdaq yesterday. It feels like a little bit of repositioning again around the AI story. And video out this week, we had an update from Microsoft, the latest around it AI journey. And you can see the Nasdaq are reaching for further territory up another 100 plus points or six tenths of a percent to that record level. And video, the big moving name, as you can see, for the Nasdaq. So investors now responding already. Three brokerages lifting their NVIDIA price targets, or this even ahead of glimpsing the numbers this time round. So again, moving the needle as the market is anticipating. We have almost a macro event this week as we get set up for the NVIDIA numbers. In terms of uh, what we saw elsewhere on the Dow, the retreat in contrast to the tech sector gains that we witnessed that impacted uh, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, the Dow suffered as a result of JP Morgan. And you saw those comments in the headlines, uh, Jamie Dimon saying he's cautiously pessimistic and the company would not buy back the stock at current prices. It's been trading around records. So as a result, uh, the under two we're seeing from that stock impacting the fortunes of the Dow. Treasuries, uh, still a lot of commentary about uh, the timing of any Fed rate cut, how many will be the likely course of action for the central bank. You can see at the short end, we're at 4.83. Long end, we've drifted, uh, we're below the 4.5% mark, 4.44 morning session, just trying to pick up a little bit of territory. To the dollar as a result, uh, this is the early picture. Sterling euro climbing, uh, both of those currencies making some traction this morning. Cable 127.07, a uh, fraction ahead, 108.5 plus on euro dollar. But uh, the greenback climbing versus the Japanese yen, 156.41. Still a, a big dose of geopolitics out there as we talk about the uh, situation in Iran on the back of the helicopter crash and what we're also witnessing still around Gaza. Let me take you to the Asian markets and what we're witnessing on the stock market markets. It is a downbeat session for Hong Kong. We've got a retreat there. We're down near on 2%, 384 odd points to the downside. So fairly weak hand there, along with the Chinese stock market slipping four tenths of a percent versus just modest loss on Tokyo and Australian stocks, just pulling back a fraction stick. Good morning, Karen. How are you? Very well, thank Off you. Off on your travels, do all things tech in about five or six hours? It's good timing, isn't it, after that Microsoft update and video this week? Uh, we'll talk all about this over the next coming days and, of course, NVIDIA. But, but don't you just hate meetings? I'm sure all our viewers hate meetings. I Which ones? Online, in person? All of them. The They're dull as ditch water. I prefer doing my job rather than talking about doing mm. my job as well. And what I really hate about meetings is when you're, you're three quarters away, and let's say it's you know, a two-hour meeting, you've done a, I don't know, an hour and a half or so, and you're just bored senses, but everyone in that meeting feels they have to say something to justify their existence. They're the ones I really dislike, uh, whether it's my colleagues or... or but it's like it's like... Don't bother saying something if you've got nothing new to add. Yeah. And herein lies my problem and bringing it back to where we are because it's been a thematic of this show where we are 
uninterested in hearing the same again from Fed officials who are just saying the same old thing. I'm pleased to say others are now cottoning on and our dear friends over at High Frequency Economic have been making the same kind of point. And I'll just go through a couple of the latest bullets uh, from Carl Weinberg. No fewer than five Fed officials took to the microphones yesterday. I think Bostic spoke three times. Uh, mostly, they reiterated already stated views. Uh, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic opened the day with the TV interview speaking in riddles. <laughs> this is Carl Weinberg. He said the economy is slowing, but only slowly. The labor market is softening, softening but it's not slow, soft yet, etc., etc. Overall, we heard a lot of noise yesterday, but we did not see any market moving comments. The gist was that rates are on hold for now, but they may still come later this year, i.e. the cuts as well. It's the same story derived from 14 Fed speakers delivering 21 speeches and interviews. This is exhausting. It's like watching paint dry, isn't it? I'm just putting a little fingertip on the edge, seeing whether we're dry just yet. And you're thinking, oh, moments, they're not quite there, possibly there. It's just like that bit in meetings where everyone's done it and you just lower your phone from the table and you just start going on a doom scroll just you to kind of- WhatsApping everyone. <laughs> WhatsApping and doom scrolling. And then you WhatsApp your colleague over the other side of the meeting saying, are you as bored as me? Let's get this over and done with. And that person's trying not to laugh. We've all done it, all of you lot. Anyway, as I mentioned, a flock of a flock. Oh, yeah, we were trying to find a collective noun for flock. They went with flock. I, I, I thought a dullard, a, a dullard of Fed speak official. Apparently that one didn't make the A cacophony was up there as well. Right. You weren't in the voting. You were I doing other a, things. A chorus. A chorus, yes. Uh, well, let's go with a flock because that's what Mike wrote in the end. Uh, a flock of Fed officials gave their take on the rate debate on Monday. A stubborn inflation continues to cast doubt on the central bank's rate path. We've written this before as well. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mesta stepped back from her previous forecast of three cuts, saying inflation risks have moved up and that progress on CPI had stalled. Fed Vice Chair Philip Jefferson also raised concerns over price pressures, arguing it's too early to say whether recent declines in inflation will be long lasting. You get my gist. I'll carry on while I still can. And another Fed Vice Chair, Michael Barr, said he'd been disappointed by inflation prints in the first quarter. The aforementioned Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed also waded into debate, I think three times, saying that price pressures are proving to be resilient. Last year's rapid disinflation has slowed, uh, but I will say for me, my base outlook is still that we're gonna be able to get to 2%. Uh, it's just gonna take a lot longer than I think most had anticipated. Do you have the thumb ready? It's uh, Jamie Dimon's turn. Oh, Did he say anything different? Oh, well, the thing about Jamie Dimon is he's never dull, actually. And exactly. he did say something very interesting oh, yesterday. I thought so. So yeah, he might actually so, get yeah. the gladiator move. Yeah, but he's not, a, he's not, he couldn't stand <laughs> Fed meetings any more than I could. Uh, JP Morgan boss Jamie Dimon issued a downbeat assessment of the US economy and warned inflation is more sticky than expected. I'm cautiously pessimistic. We have the most complicated geopolitical situation that most of us have seen since World War II, if you study history. Uh, we don't really know the full effect of QT. I find it mysterious that somehow it had this beneficial effect, but it's not gonna have a negative effect when it goes away. Uh, and I personally think that inflation may be a little stickier than people think, and that rates may surprise people. Let's get to Josh Corrin, who has found a musketeer capital partners. Josh, you've given us a lot of stock trades, but I want to get to the overall market view of this stage on the back of the Fed, because we keep on hearing this commentary that we're getting there eventually when it comes to the rate cuts. What do you think it means? Because some market commentators are setting up for a fairly decent market move if we get much firmer signals around a rate cut. But it feels like we've already climbed towards some type of peak. So how much more can there really be around monetary policy re-rating? Absolutely. Well, for sure. First, thank you so much for having me back on the show. I always really appreciate it. And yes, to your point, I think after the last Fed meeting where Jerome Powell was significantly more dovish than people had expected him to be, um, the market definitely recalibrated and started to, again, expect rate cuts. However, as you see the 10-year still hovering between about 4.3 and 4.4, it is still in a quite elevated state. And that's also been expressed in terms of market positioning. So if you see the large Large caps really have been just having tremendous leadership all year, and that has been partially due to the macro uncertainty, partially due to this flight to quality, 
but the mid caps have really been underperforming. And you know, going forward, we think that that pocket, that mid cap pocket, is what could start to benefit. You know, if rates start to come down and you see some of these smaller names start to catch up, um, and we don't see kind of too much risk of an overestimation of rate cuts in the market just yet. So going into that last Fed meeting, uh, you had really no cuts priced in anymore. As and as a matter of fact, there was even a base case of hikes, which we always thought was overly draconian. Now coming out of that last Fed meeting, people start to expect about one to two cuts again. And we think that that's fairly appropriate. Although they may happen later in the year, we think that the regime is more or less also, even though they'd like to not admit it, politically motivated to get something done before the election to give Biden that victory. So we think that right now the market is calibrated quite fairly and and, and we see kind of an okay canvas for stock picking going forward. Josh, my problem is when the bears start throwing in the towel and the baby goes out with the bathwater and his capitulation, all, you know, all the analogies in one there as well, then that starts making me think maybe we're making a market top as well. Nothing scientific about it, but Morgan Stanley's Michael Wilson, one of the biggest bears out there. The news of the last 24 hours is he's done mea culpa. I was wrong. I've revised my target <laughs> now from 4,500. He switched the numbers up to 5,400. Is that a bear signal when the bears start throwing in the towel? No, you know, I think that it's realistic. Look, I think that it's just really important to understand that, you know, assets have to have a place to go. People want to make money. It's been a couple of really frustrating years where people have just dealt with, you know, everything from macroeconomic to geopolitical forces. And what I think that this market is showing you is that the investor is more resilient than people would like to think. Now, within that market, you see these weird pockets, right? Like these times where only a few stocks perform and everything else underperforms, but always kind of something is performing. And I think to what, what Mike was kind of saying was, listen, in all of these outcomes we're likely to have going forward, it's just hard to see people really just give up on equities and sell in mass scale. Now, in our opinion, what that means is that you just have to be better at stock picking. So we don't see massive upside coming for the QQQ going forward. As a matter of fact, we see the QQQ, the Dow, the S&P at all time highs potentially struggling going forward, just given the fact that the names that are comprising so much of these indexes are pretty stretched and crowded with high expectations. That said, we don't see a complete collapse of the equity markets like we saw a couple of times in the past couple of years. And what we think is that there's alpha opportunities for those who are going after dislocated ideas and, and truly good stock picking. So we think that there'll be an OK canvas. And, you know, we agree with Mike's ball. We, we don't think that things are, are too euphoric. We just think that the indexes are a little extended and now it's time for other names to catch up. Josh, one stock that a lot of traders have picked is NVIDIA. You like AMD over NVIDIA. I think this is interesting because the Microsoft update we saw overnight suggests that AI on PC is actually more of a Qualcomm story rather than AMD Intel story. So why is AMD still ticking the boxes for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I can mention a couple of stocks here, but AMD is just a prime example. So if you think about it, what has really led the way all year, right? It has been these large caps in the indexes and we don't blame them. NVIDIA's growth has been phenomenal. But at this point, with the stock at 950, near that 975 all-time intraday high, there's nothing here that people don't really expect. So how much more capital is this business really going to attract to it? If the, if the stock were to go up another 20%, it's basically creating another AMD. Well, just to give you an example, the type of stock picking that we're advocating for, look at AMD. It had an intraday high of 217, you know, maybe in March. Since then, the last quarter was fine. The stock had a negative reaction, but numbers largely were intact or went up. And we thought that this Microsoft announcement for uh, for next for that came out last week was transformational for the stock. Um, you know, the bull case on AMD is that they can take share from NVIDIA. Having Microsoft Azure as a client really going out there and pushing this generative AI hyperscale product with an AMD option relative to NVIDIA, which is something that was new, gives CTOs the incentive to just try something. Because if you are a CTO, what do you want to do? You want to prove your worth to the CEO. You want to be different. Every one of these clients are trying to create their own edge, their own barrier to entry, right? So it's very likely that people will try that AMD product and that'll be a boost to share gain. So when we look at AMD, we see, you know, on buy side estimates, a relatively cheap stock. We think numbers are low now after the Microsoft estimate. And we think that the stock has a lot of room to go. 
Um, you know, and if I may, it's kind of a parallel to, to you know, another stock I had mentioned to you guys, you know, in the, in the e-commerce space. So we're looking for smid cap names like the one I mentioned was a Jumia Technologies instead of Amazon. So this is something that's the Amazon of Africa, one and a half time sales growing 57 percent year over over year you know, at a valuation that just doesn't make sense. So we're going after these types of situations, A and B, Jumia, where you have a margin of safety, the stock has underperformed, and we see real alpha coming forward there as a stock picker, not just relying on these heavy index weighted large caps that are already really crowded. Josh, uh, thank you very much for updating us on the strategy and giving us some names. Josh Curran with us, founder Musketeer Capital Partners. Microsoft has announced a new category of PCs with inbuilt AI features. The first Copilot Plus devices will be released next month, with Microsoft announcing a Surface Laptop and Surface Pro tablet that will be able to run some AI tasks without an internet connection. Steve Kovach has more on the announcement. Microsoft announcing a new generation of PCs ahead of its Build Developers Conference this week, calling them Copilot PCs. They come from manufacturers like Dell, HP, Samsung, and Microsoft itself, and they come with a new PC chip from Qualcomm capable of processing Microsoft's AI tasks on the device, whereas before they needed an internet connection. Microsoft says it expects this crop of AI PCs to convince people to upgrade their old devices and plans to sell 50 million of them by the end of the year. They start shipping next month. But the hardware means really nothing without AI capabilities on the software side. Microsoft Copilot Assistant getting a number of upgrades on Windows, including automatic photo editing, real-time translation of languages, and a new feature called Recall that can remember everything you've ever done on your PC. Windows will also incorporate OpenAI's latest version of ChatGPT, announced just last week. That one's coming soon. Microsoft also took several shots at Apple, claiming these AI PCs are faster and more capable than Apple's latest MacBook Air that launched just a few months ago. Microsoft is also undercutting Apple on price as well. Not to mention, Apple doesn't yet have generative AI tools like Copilot on Macs or iPhones. The message here, Apple's behind on AI, while Microsoft, the current leader for the technology, keeps pushing forward. For CNBC Business News, I'm Steve Kovac. I thought there was a lot in that, we'll discuss it later on, but a lot of stock-specific news for Apple, Qualcomm, and also the likes of ARM in terms of the architecture. But let's get to NVIDIA. The earnings are set to dominate the market outlook this week. Earnings per share seen up more than 400% on the year, slightly slower than the near 500% posted last quarter. Expectations are high for the chipmaker, which has beaten earnings expectations by double digits in the last four quarters, with Evercore ISI saying another EPS beat is, quote, the worst kept secret in corporate America. Niles Investment Management founder Dan Niles dismissed concerns around the company's valuation. The stock is trading 15 percent below its five year average on a P.E. basis. And so that's why my thoughts are you get a slight move up in the stock when they report because it is actually historically cheap um, on a price to earnings basis. Right, one of the big factors to the downside was JP Morgan yesterday. Now the shares fell after Jamie Dimon makes a surprising admission at the bank's investor day. Now later this morning, we're gonna get the latest producer price data out of Germany as markets eye further signs of inflation easing ahead of what is expected to be a rate cut from ECB. And AstraZeneca prepares to unveil its roadmap at its investor day. We'll be crossing to Arabile in Cambridge and we're going to hear from the CFO, Aradana Sarin. That's coming up at 8.40 Central European time. Listen to CNBC's Beyond the Valley, the podcast that explores the biggest tech news from across the globe. Join me, Arjun Karpal. And me, Tom Chitty, every week as we bring you insights into the top stories, unpack the latest trends, and find out where the industry is headed. Now available on Spotify, Apple Music, and Google Podcasts. Welcome back. Indian voters took to the polls on Monday to cast their ballots in the fifth stage of the country's general election, the world's largest election in the world's largest democracy. I think, in fact, I know for a fact, the world's largest population. It began in April and takes place across seven stages uh, with a final result expected at the beginning of 
June. Uh, Shimita Devashwa is the chief India economist at Global Data of Global Data at TS Lombard. Nice to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Um, well, this is such a huge, elongated process as well. I guess the, the simplest question is where are we at? What's it looking like at this stage? I was traveling across uh, three states uh, with a bunch of, uh, of senior journalists, in fact, and we thought that it is a much closer contest than was initially anticipated. Um, so we're not allowed to release uh, polls during the election, but the opinion polls that were released before that all showed that um, Prime Minister Modi is going to walk away with the election. Mm. But it seems that on the ground it is tighter than um, was initially expected, and they may not get as many seats as they did last time round. That's fascinating because looking into this story from the outside and, and having the fantastic coverage we've had on the ground from our correspondent Sri Jagaraja as well, is it, it, the, from my interpretation, the cult of personality that Mr Modi has built around himself, naming the magnificent new cricket stadium after himself, and, and it's almost a presidential presence he's created rather than a prime minister. It seems that I, almost every other politician seems almost secondary compared to Mr Modi in the country at the moment. He's built this huge personality um, cult around him almost. As well. Who are the major contenders? I mean, could anyone fill his shoes at the moment? Or, or else, yeah, there are lots of individual problems that people are very annoyed about. Exactly. So, uh, Prime Minister Modi remains extremely popular and, um, you know, his, his brand is, is, is huge, as you said. Uh, but I think that people are more concerned about what's happening in their daily lives. Right. And they think that, uh, you know, uh, Modi is going to come at the centre anyway. We don't necessarily need to vote for him because we need to vote for those people who are going to deliver for us in That's our right. constituencies. Um, and also a couple of other things have happened that um, the, the BJP had this very strong uh, slogan going that we're going to cross uh, 400 seats, which in, um, uh, and that really caught on. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, there was some uh, missteps where a BJP party official said that they may change the constitution and then that developed a life of its own and, and people got concerned that, mm. you know, that we don't want such a strong government that may change the constitution and may affect, in fact, um, reservations which are, which is basically affirmative action where jobs are reserved for the, um, for the backward castes. Uh, so there are lots of interesting, you know, it's such a long yeah. drawn election. We don't know what's happening in between because it's, it's 44 days long. Um, but that's the sense that we're getting on the ground. Let me bring up unemployment and inflation. These are two areas around the economy that have been decided where people are concerned, which is just extraordinary because we keep talking about the China plus one policy. And we all know that India has been a beneficiary. There's a big pivot by a lot of corporations to put facilities on the ground in India. Why is unemployment rate, the unemployment rate so high in that context? Why are jobs not being created? So a lot of the action that is happening even in terms of job creation and investment is in sectors that are a bit niched, more, more industrialized sectors, uh, not really in sectors that are creating mass employment. Um, so as a result of that, we don't have enough jobs being created even though the economy seems to be growing faster than any other major economy. But at the same time, it's not growing as fast as it needs to, to create that kind of mass base of employment. We have a very strong um, services sector, but we don't have that strong of a manufacturing sector. So enough people are not being able to move from farms to factories, which is really, you know, in economic theory, that's always been the first step to get those hordes of people who are working in the farm sector out into, um, uh, you know, more formal uh, manufacturing sector. Which means they get all the negatives from economic growth, uh, for instance inflation, and the inflation rate is much higher than what the central bank is aiming for, food in particular. How big an election issue is food? Because across other Asian economies we've seen, I mean South Korea was a great example around green onions. What is it meaning for some of the voters in India as they face still rising food prices? Um, exactly. So food is still a very big part of the Indian CPI basket. So, we're, you know, it's around 45 percent. So it, it is a very touchy issue. So even though the central bank has a 2 to 6 percent um, inflation target and inflation has come down, headline inflation has come down, you still have food inflation running at above 8.5 percent. And that, of course, affects everyone, you know, in their daily lives. So as I said, things like jobs and inflation have been, um, uh, you know, big concerns. 
and people are saying that okay you know development is happening but how is my life being affected mm. and and that's the major issue at play here that people aren't seeing a material change to their daily lives and daily problems yeah and as we see when you get western style growth in the economy you get western style prices and property I and mean, Mumbai one of the most hottest property markets on the planet just give me a little bit of a, a almost a technical answer to this one as well. So the, the, a simple majority is 272 seats. You talked about 400 seats. Is that that's where they can change the constitution? Then is if they get to 400 seats? Yeah, they need a two-thirds majority right. in parliament. And here it's a simple majority. So 272 is 50 percent. It's the it's the halfway mark. Mm. Now the thing is that they may still be able to form the government with the help of allies. But as such, it it just creates a perception that the BJP hasn't performed as well as we thought it would and Mr. Modi is not as invincible as it was assumed to be. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market moving news, you can head to cnbc.com or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho and myself, Arabi Lekumete, weekdays on CNBC.